All right, if you're tuning in right now, you'd know that we've been hit by yet another massive ransomware attack. Last month, it was WannaCry that really held corporations around the world to a standstill. In fact, even Britain's health service was actually impacted by it. Last night, it was yet another massive ransomware attack, and this time it held major corporations like Maersk, WPP to, to ransom, and not just that, it also actually impacted ports all over Europe and even here in Mumbai and brought them to a standstill as well because servers were actually impacted, they were infected and then cut off. If you thought WannaCry, which was last month, left you teary-eyed, then you can listen to the experts and we're going to bring them in on this show. Well, you sh believe you me, this one, whether you call it Petia or not Petia, well, this one's a lot stronger, a lot smarter, and it's spreading like wildfire. And someone who knows exactly how to put out that forest fire is with us today on this live. Sai Hridayatullah. Sai, thanks so much for joining us, man. Thanks, Sai. How are you doing? All right, Sai, we were talking earlier, and everyone's been covering how this is a massive attack and how this could be much bigger than WannaCry. But what I want to understand from you is you're an ethical hacker, You've been on either side of uh, the hacking fence, so to speak. You understand exactly what hackers are doing. You now run a very popular cybersecurity firm called Smokescreen. When it comes to WannaCry and you compare it to Petia or not Petia, you're going to explain to us what the nomenclature is all about. How is this one so much stronger and, and wiser than its previous rendition? I think, Ayush, uh, hackers are very good at learning from their mistakes. and. Um, you know, everybody knows that WannaCry was a wake-up call, but it had a fundamental flaw, which was what was called the kill switch, which allowed, you know, uh, security professionals like myself to shut down uh, the, the, the virus before it could really do, uh, you know, very serious damage. The difference with Petya and not Petya, and I'm glad you addressed that because that's a controversial topic right now, is that it's learned and it's evolved. So basically, uh, the author has made sure that he's put in more resilience to allow the virus to spread far more organically and far faster, mm -hmm. even if organizations couldn't place the patches that were, uh, that were required at the time of WannaCry. So this is not WannaCry version 2. This right. is WannaCry++. Plus plus. So there's a whole lot of new things that companies will have to do to deal with something like this particular malware. Uh, what they did before is not going to be enough. Right, Sire, but when it comes to the technology and the technicality of it, and I'm using loose terms here because I want the viewers to understand the scale of this attack and why I say this is like WannaCry or some sort of ransomware like WannaCry, but on steroids. Because uh, it's a lot more potent, it's perhaps a lot more virulent, and the fact that you have this patch, all right, let's go back, rewind one month ago. And what we saw was how all cybersecurity firms and antivirus companies are telling you to install that patch. And that Microsoft patch will actually be the panacea to your problems when it comes to spreading that virus, right? It's going to stop that spreading from happening. Now what you're telling me is that this used the same exploit, that same file, which was supposed to be patched by Microsoft. It used something similar as an entry point, perhaps. But then what happens next is a whole different ball game. Yeah, you, you said it, Ayush. What happens next is actually very interesting. What the new malware does is that it actually uses the built-in capabilities in your Windows operating system to spread. Right. WannaCry needed to spread, uh, you know, because of a vulnerability, something that your IT guys could actually fix. What this does is that it actually uses the same tools and protocols that your IT guy uses to manage your computers right. to spread itself. That means that it's not easy to block because if you block it, you block the sort of stuff that your IT guy needs to actually make sure that the business runs. Okay, and if all the IT guys are watching, I must tell you, well, Sahar is going to tell you the next move because the IT guy could be very uh, central and key to solving this problem. because. Sire, how does the IT guy come in? And uh, for all the IT guys watching, including our IT guy, uh, how can they stop this perhaps, or at least go to some extent to actually mitigating this problem? So without getting too technical, Ayush, I think what's very important is uh, companies need to adopt certain basic network hygiene. This boils down to a few areas. The first is that they need to have good network segregation. 
there's no reason why somebody who's working in a branch office should be able to access, say, a critical server unless they need it for their work. This stops the malware sort of from spreading beyond a natural organization boundary. And those natural organization boundaries have to be implemented in, in, in the network as well. That's a starting point. Okay. The second is the sharing of passwords. If I break into your system and you know get access to a password from your IT guy, if he's using the same password on every single company uh, in the organization, I'm going to be able to go to each and every single one of them. So is that, is that uh, Sahir, is that usually the case? So just getting into the mind of the hacker right now and into the mind of the IT guy, two places I didn't want to be today, but if I do get into those two minds, how does it work? So the hacker comes up with that piece of code. If you could take us step by step, and how does the IT guy in some way perhaps not uh, contribute in not perhaps solving the problem here? That's the best way to put it. So it's pretty, um you know, it's not pretty well known actually that every single person who's logged into your computer since it was last rebooted, if you're on Windows, um, some remnant of their password in different forms is actually still stored in the memory of the system. Right. So what the hackers do is when they break in, they extract that particular password or, you know, uh, hash as we call it, and then use it to move from system to system. So if your IT guy has used the same password on you know, 200 computers, when I break into one, I can move to the next 199. So it's very important that the IT guys don't you know, reuse the passwords, and there are a number of you know, public and free tools available to stop this. Right. Uh, more important is the fact that, at the end of the day, ransomware is a backup problem. If the users have not backed up their data, and if you've not backed up and tested your backup, it's not a backup. Right. Uh, nothing is going to help you. Your computer gets, uh, you know, gets encrypted. The only way you're going to reliably get your files back is if you've done the due diligence to make sure that you've backed up your own files. Right. No. So there's also a lot of things been going on, um, you know, and been spreading all over through social networks as to the do's and don'ts. And I don't want to get into the cliche do's and don'ts because we all know we should have up-to-date software. We all know that that Microsoft patch should have been in place, which seems a little futile in this scenario because I want you to really. Um, tell us in layman's language because we want to understand from uh, you know an ethical hacker how it really works because if you're telling me the the entry point the exploit eternal blue which was actually used to enter systems has been used again so I as a user or as someone in a company a top company um, or a vendor I perhaps just click on a link in an email and well that perhaps has this piece of malware embedded in it it comes into my system through the same way that ransomware um, wanna cry actually made me wanna cry. What happens next? After that, that patch was actually supposed to stop, the Windows patch was supposed to stop the propagation and the movement of this within my network. Why is this one so wise that it manages uh, to really you know, permeate and, and go through? So, so, so you said it, Ayush. Um if you've got the patch in place, you thought you were okay post one right? right? Unfortunately, that's not the case today. What this particular malware has done is it's adopted the techniques that typically a more targeted attacker would use. This is something that's global scale. They're, they're not you know, specifically calling out a specific organization. What they're doing is they're using a technique that is typically used by a hacker who's going to pick one bank or one, uh, you know, healthcare institution to move around the network and they've adopted that and mass you know sort of uh, mass produced it so that they can move around in any company that's a big problem because these organizations don't have internal visibility they don't know once once something gets behind their initial firewall they don't really know what's going on and right. that's uh, yeah right no so think about it i mean for all of you watching this particular facebook live Imagine everything we spoke about six weeks ago when it came to WannaCry. This new virus, Petia, not Petia, whatever you want to call it, let's call it Virus X uh, for the purpose of this life. This Virus X enters your system in the same way and it doesn't matter what antivirus, what you have, as long as it can access the credentials perhaps of your administrator and then wreak havoc all throughout your system. So I remember, Sahar, when we spoke about the, the WannaCry attack, you mentioned that there are several other issues, like the golden ticket which you hackers talk about uh, and how it gives you access for nearly 10 years. Uh, do those red flags, are those same red flags raised in this situation as well? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you're a professional hacker that really wants to make money, and I haven't really checked what was the last uh, payment to the Bitcoin account for this malware, right. but when I checked earlier today, it was it wasn't a very large amount. It was about you know five to six lakhs, which is a really bad payoff to become you know part of a global manhunt. Right. Uh, so so just I'm just gonna just gonna stop you there, Cyrus. So when you talk about this uh, hard coded Bitcoin wallet. To just to let the viewers know so that we don't get carried away in this technology conversation well there's a bitcoin wallet which the hackers are using which is where you when you start your computer you come it comes up with a screen full of code telling you that 300 dollars uh, worth in bitcoins has to be paid or wired to this bitcoin wallet right sire correct me if i'm wrong that's correct yeah. and if you don't well then they're not going to give you access if you do then they will decrypt your system and you're free to use it again. But there are more nuances to that situation, which is what Sire is going to tell us. Sire, and now tell us if the golden ticket comes in, because that's something that I'm very wary of. So that's basically where Ayush, the, the, the real professional targeted hacker will come in. There are certain ways uh, in your company network where a seasoned attacker can attack just one system. And from that, he can get what's literally called the golden ticket. This gives him the ability to break in again for say the next 10 to 15 years it's it's a technical way that these networks are set up right and that's something that companies don't really know about they're focusing on something like this malware attack or want to uh, want to cry because it's so noisy but um, the larger problem are the ones you're not hearing about if i was a hacker today would i rather steal you know a few pesce from millions of people or would I rather steal, you know, hundreds of crores from one person going really targeted? And that's right. the larger question going forward. And and that's something that I wanted to speak to you as well uh, about, Sahir, was that what would the end game be? I mean, you understand how hackers really operate. What would the end game be? So you're telling me that perhaps this, these are just uh, perhaps, you know, uh, not going to all go well for the future. These are just signs. And perhaps there's something far more ominous, far far more calculated, far more targeted that could be planned using this as a base? There's, a, there's you know, sort of an unspoken uh, motto amongst hackers that if your hack is known about, then you've done it wrong, right, Ayush? Right. So, I, I mean, something like this gets a lot of attention. It raises awareness. It's good for, you know, the cybersecurity ecosystem in general. But it's not going to be a huge payoff for the hacker, I'll wager with you. What, what you're not hearing about are the number of companies that get targeted on a regular basis, and many of them in India as well, who are subject to targeted ransom attacks. Right. And are, are, are you know, th those numbers are astronomical. The things that are happening behind the scenes, those are the things that the board needs to worry about. It's no longer an IT issue. It's no longer something you can push to the guy in security. It has to be something as fundamental as marketing or sales that the board and the senior leadership understands and adopts and then passes on to specialists. Fair enough, fair enough. That seems like a more a plausible end game, Sahir. But also, you mentioned it's not just about IT departments, not just about corporations. With this attack, you realize that it's also about perhaps governments. And that whole, that whole you know, you and cry that everyone's raising about cyber terrorism, this could perhaps be used against governments as well. I mean, how immune uh, would perhaps a country like India or anyone you know in in this region one of these countries how immune would we be to such an attack was it targeted at a government institution or at at you know government servers so that's a very good question uh, there are a number of agencies uh, you know on the government side that work very hard and have some very good people you know trying to protect us and and deal with these problems mm -hmm. but the scale of the problem is very vast if you look at India's digital infrastructure, especially as we go into digital India and we you know, start bringing more things online, that's a really vast ecosystem to secure and there are going to be holes. It's impossible to secure it 24 by 7, 365 days a year. Are there going to be breaches? Yes. Do the public need to know about them? Absolutely. Uh, what I think is really important is to understand that some of the people who will target India are at the top end of the scale. These are apex attackers coming out of countries that are, have very you know, vested interests in making sure that they get access to critical infrastructure, financial information, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, all sorts of other companies that are you know, economically viable. 
And that's something that the government is aware of and is doing a lot about. The Prime Minister has spoken about cybersecurity as well. Is it a solved problem? Absolutely not. We've got a long way to go. Fair enough. So I think, uh, you know, it, it, these kind of discussions will go a long way when it comes to raising awareness as to what happened. Well, in terms of the scale of this attack, if you're wondering how massive it is, well, Sire, I'm, I'm guessing this will take a few days for us to assess how how much this is actually permeated into systems in India. We saw what happened at JNPT. Well, the full port uh, really came to a standstill. We saw what happened in Rotterdam as well and in other ports around Europe. Uh, perhaps this is not completely contained. There's a lot more for us to see ahead. Ayush, the problem is exactly that. There's no disclosure law in India. Right. If, if I held your personal valuables and they were stolen, I would have some sort of obligation to disclose that this happened. Right. Unfortunately, in cybersecurity today, companies can be hacked, uh, can lose everything, can lose your data, it can be sold on the dark net. Uh, and, we, you know, exactly, we saw that happen with the Zomato hacking as well. Yeah. And there's no obligation to report. So the problem is not the ones you hear about, the problem is the ones that you haven't heard about, Ayush. Right, so Sahir, and also there's this very quick rumor that I wanted to spell. People are talking about uh, the fact and the real situation when you get impacted or when you're hit by this or infected initially and we know how it spreads now because you've explained it very very succinctly but when it actually hits and that DOS screen comes up that command prompt comes up on your on your desktop well they say that there's something about rebooting is there any you know any quick tip you want to give us about not rebooting your system or rebooting it or it doesn't make a real difference so in this specific case are you um as an employee, the first thing you should say is, uh, I've got a couple of days off from work. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, more seriously, I would say don't touch the system. Each case is very specific. Okay. You need to get on the phone with your IT guy immediately, and he's got the best possible information and chance of recovering that information. And, um, and definitely not to pay up the $300 in Bitcoins? This is something that's always, uh, you know, a question. In, in the case of this specific incident, my understanding is that the email address which you're supposed to communicate with, which will give you back your, you know, the password to decrypt your files, it's been shut down. So if you're paying up, chances are you're not going to get your files. I would urge anybody who's doing this to hold on. The security community is working hard to figure out if there are loopholes and ways to decrypt your files anyway. So don't pay up. That's a very bad uh, way to go about it. Fair enough, Sire. Thanks so much. You know, so guys, if you're watching, this is a quick update, right? Wanna cry, uh, petia, not petia, whatever you might call it. it. Might be something in May, something in June, something in July. Well, hackers out there are actively working on these ransomware attacks, and the scale could get a lot bigger. It could impact us in India. It could. I mean, the scale of this is really global. So maybe the worst is still to come and we need to be prepared. Thanks so much, Sire, for joining us on this Facebook Live, and thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks, Ken.